God's grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who's risen. Amen. The Apostle Peter put it this way. Always be prepared to give an answer for, uh, every, to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. That's the question today. What is the hope we have as Christians? And I need your help for it. We've planned for this for a whole year. This is the end of the church year. So throughout the whole year, we've given the Christian message and we end it with hope. It's all about hope. So what is our hope? If somebody comes up to you, a newspaper reporter, puts a microphone in your face and says, tell me, what is the Christian hope? What is that hope? Congregation of God. <laughs> Spend forever with Jesus. Good answer, good start. There's more than one answer. I know people are nervous. It's like there's a right one. Well, you hit it real good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> But there's other ones. What's the Christian hope? Spread the word of God. Love one another. Forgiveness. Forgiveness of sins. We have hope. We can stroll into heaven because our sins are paid for. Imperfect people can go to a perfect place because all the bad things we've ever thought, done, said, they're gone taken away, we're free. What else? The Christian hope is? Share the gospel, Share the gospel. okay? Believe, and you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Now, let's transport ourselves. Instead of coming to a Lutheran church this morning, you came to a Baptist church. What would they speak of? We hope. <laughs> but they speak a little bit more than Lutherans will often do of things like Christ is coming, his return, his final return when he comes to judge the world, sending some to heaven and some away from God's presence forever. You might hear in a Baptist church about the rapture. Is not that our hope too? We'll talk about that a little bit later. I want to simplify it for you. This is kind of the, um, I would say the punchline. And Janet had access to my notes or something, so she did really good. Um, here's what I would say the Christian hope is. The Christian hope is first seeing Jesus. Seeing Jesus, that takes us back to the Old Testament reading. We have Job, one of the oldest books in the Bible. Some think it may be, you know, before even Moses' writings. And what do we find in there? Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the end he'll stand upon the earth, and with my flesh I will see God. My own eyes will see him. So it's about seeing Jesus first. I would say the Christian hope is all centered around Jesus. We've got to start there. But it's seeing Jesus. If you love somebody, you want to see them. You anticipate seeing them. How many have plans for Thanksgiving of one sort or another? If you have kids coming back from college, you look forward to seeing them. Or maybe you're going to grandma or grandpa's. You're excited about going to be with them. Same like Jesus. We look forward to seeing him. But secondly, we want to be with him. You know, it's not too cool. Hi, grandma or grandpa. And then you go out and play and you never talk to them or tell them how your life is going. Part of the joy is just being there with somebody. And that's what the Bible invites us to do, to be with Jesus, to be with God, something even more amazing. The Christian hope is 
about not just being with Jesus. This is shocking. Being like him. Being like him. You say, Pastor, you don't know me. It reminds me of a saint of God. I walked into a hospital room one day, and I said to this woman, I said, it happened to be All Saints Day. I'll call her Mary. Mary, you're a saint of God. She said, Pastor, you don't know me very well, do you? I'm no saint. And I said, Mary, saints are people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who've been forgiven of their sins, who have hope of life forever. You believe that, don't you? She said, I most certainly do. And I said, Mary, you're a saint. We don't often think that way, but when we see Jesus face to face, we will be like him. Now, there's a problem. Before we get there, we have to deal with another reality. Somebody spoke of another preacher. So I have to read this about this uh, preacher. I don't know if you've heard this before or not. It goes like this. There's a preacher of the old school. He speaks as boldly as ever. He's not popular, though the world is his parish. He travels every part of the globe. He speaks in every language. He visits the poor. He calls upon the rich. He preaches to people of every religion and those that have no religion. The subject of his sermon is always the same. He's an eloquent preacher, often stirring feelings which no other preacher could in bringing tears to eyes that never weep. His arguments none are able to refute, nor is there any heart that has remained unmoved by the force of his appeals. He shatters life with his message. Most people hate him. Everyone fears him. His name? Death. Every tombstone is his pulpit, every newspaper prints his text, and someday everyone will be his sermon. Is the Christian hope death? Well, it would be without Jesus Christ. Job also says, if a man dies, will he live again? Listen to the answers of people that you maybe respect a little bit and should, but their answers aren't correct ones from a Christian standpoint. Socrates, the philosopher, was in his prison cell dying from drinking the hemlock. One of his disciples whispered to him, Master, will we live again? Socrates answered, I hope so, but no one can know for sure. All too often, people have this definition of hope, like a little boy who said, hope is wishing for something you know ain't going to happen. It's not what Job said. I know that my Redeemer lives. But men do fear death. They try to ignore it. But it will come. Our lives apart from Christ's return will end in a grave. But that's not the end. You know, it's kind of like um, we have funerals and people will say, you know, spend a little time and then it's kind of over. Well, for the Christian, it's not over. My mom and dad are alive. They're alive in heaven. I miss them, but they're alive. The Christian hope is that we can grieve, but we look forward in hope. I want to show you a few pictures that kind of jarred uh, the reality for me of death. Megan, the first picture is um, just a simple little plaque of a, of a bridge, Spruer Bridge in Lucerne, Switzerland. Now, I think they know this, but you want to be reminded every day of the reality of death? You walk through this bridge. Next slide, please. Again, just an ordinary bridge going over this river in Lucerne, Switzerland. You would think nothing of it until you start climbing the steps to go up to the bridge, and you'll see a whole bunch of these. Next slide, please. 
there are these kind of like plaques that there's 45 of them you walk underneath. Now, if you put your head up, what you see is the reality depicted over and over again of death. How ways people can die. No situation, you can be in the city, you can be in the country. Every place life is present. And day after day, men and women in Lucerne, Switzerland walk across this bridge, the bridge of death being reminded that they'll die, but going about their business as if it's not there. Now, the beautiful thing is that the bridge is a wonderful picture. How do we get from a world of death to a world of life? It is a bridge. Jesus put it clearly. I am the bridge. I'm the way the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. I was reminded of the reality of death in another spot. We took a tour in Rome, Italy. We had gone to the catacombs, which are um, an incredible experience in themselves, but we went to this place. It's called the Capucan Crypt. It was built in the 1700s, These monks would die, and they collected the bones for year after year. And what they did is they set up these crypts to frankly portray our Christian faith. But it's shocking. We're not used to it. Because you have six crypts with human skulls and human bones, and they kind of depict, you might say, artwork. And as you walk in, there's a sign that says this, what you are now, we once were. What we are now, you shall be. Not a very hopeful message, but a reminder that death comes. Now, here was the interesting thing. We had a guide as we went in there. The guide starts out by saying, you know what? It doesn't matter what you believe at all in life, as long as you're sincere. Eh, wrong. Makes all the difference. But he did have at least part of the truth. He said, as you walk into these chambers, realize that the monks who did this had a belief in the afterlife that they would go to heaven and their bodies would be raised. So we walk through these six crypts. Next slide, please. This one I was not sure to show, but it's what you see. In this case, there's three actual skeletons propped up and the bones of humans, other monks, around them. Is death the end? The Bible says, "Uh uh-uh, Jesus rose, didn't he? And because he lives, we too will live. Megan, you can take that one down, thank you. We'll have the other one later. The Christian hope has been depicted by our founding fathers as we kind of come together for Thanksgiving Day. Listen to these statements. First one from Benjamin Franklin. You go to his tomb in, in Philadelphia, And it says this, the body of Franklin printer, like the cover of an old book, its content torn out and stripped of its lettering and and gilding lies here food for worms. But the work will not be lost for it will appear once more in a new and more elegant edition revised and corrected by the author. I found this one that I really think summarized things well. John Adams, one of our former presidents, on his tombstone it says this, here lies in a state of perfect oblivion John Adams, who died September 2nd, 1811. I'm not sure about the truth of that part of things. His body is there, but the Bible teaches when we die our spirits go immediately to God, but the second part is a little bit more truthful, I think. It says, death has decomposed him, and at the great resurrection, 
Christ will recompose him. I love those words. What's the Christian hope? That Christ died for us, that Christ rose again, that we have a God of life, a God of resurrection. The psalmist said, our God is a God who saves. From the Lord comes escape from death. So you always have to ask yourself this question. Did anybody ever conquer death? Is there anyone where their tomb is empty after they've died? Answer, there's one. His name, Jesus of Nazareth. His tomb is empty, there are no bones. He was raised to live forever. But the second question is critical too. Did he make a way for me to conquer death too? Yes. Jesus said, because I live, you too shall live. Well, in our text today, which is from 1 Corinthians, is what I'm going to focus on, first, uh, chapter 15, verses 35 to 58, we hear about our hope. Our hope is heaven, to be with Jesus. But so often we forget a piece of it, I think. We confess it week after week, but we forget it. I believe in the resurrection of the body or the flesh. Sure about that, Pastor? I'm certain of it. My Savior rose, and because he rose, he can put our bodies together again. But it's a little difficult sometimes, not for God, but for us humans. There's a story that depicts what this is all about. Suppose for a moment your house burns to the ground. All that's left is rubble or ashes. Suppose you have no insurance, you have no materials left to build, rebuild your house. All you have is the remains that are left the dust. You attempt to reassure your wife. You say to her, honey, using what remains of our house, I'm going to build a house better than we had before. She might say to you, how in the world are you going to rebuild a house? It burned to the ground. How can you rebuild this house from rubble? Just like what was going on in 1 Corinthians 15. You have to understand that the Greeks had an idea there was no resurrection of body. They wanted to get rid of their body. They wanted their spirits to flow to God, their soul. They believed in the immortality of the soul, but getting rid of the body. The body is a piece of junk that's just dying. What is the scripture understanding? God created us with a human body. He breathed into us the breath of life. We became a living soul. Yes, our body dies because of sin, but God is able to put it back together again. Praise him. Verse 35, someone will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they come with? You fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. There's an interesting story about a woman who uh, tried to keep from being raised from the dead. Kind of hilarious, it's from Hanover, Germany. She placed these big blocks of granite and marble, cemented them together and then fastened heavy steel clasps over her grave with these big heavy stones. And she said, I want this message on my tomb. This burial place must never be opened. She didn't believe in the resurrection. She wanted to make sure that her remains never get, you know, got out. What happened? In time, there was a seed covered over by stones. It began to grow. Slowly, it pushed up out of the ground. It knocked the stones away. Even the metal clasp that kept the tomb shut open. If nature itself can raise, in a way, a person's body from the dead, do you think a God 
has any problem putting us back together again? Paul says, don't be foolish. We die, but God's able to put us back together again. It's important to know that Christians don't believe in reincarnation. What is reincarnation? Our soul can go into all these bodies. Frankly, if you go back, it's our soul can even go into another creature. This text says not. The Bible says not. We die, there's a judgment. We die once, it says. But God is able to put our body together again. Now what's interesting is, it's like a seed. You think the seed is dying, and in fact, it's coming forward, it's living. That's the picture Paul uses. The resurrection is about these bodies, even if they turn to dust, coming back to life. You know what's interesting? We've had this kind of fight with cloning. If you have one cell, you might be able to put a body together again. The God who created us has no problem with our bodies. Frankly, he blazes the trail. Another important point we don't think about, Jesus is fully human today. He has a human body today. It's a glorified body, but Jesus continues to have a body. He's not floating around as a spirit, and he's our picture. After the resurrection, people could touch him, he could eat. He spoke, he didn't dance on the air. Our bodies will be like this body, but not so crude as just to raise from the dead the way it is. You know, you're 90 years old, you die and you come back as a 90 year old. Nope, it's different. How so? Paul tells us, this body will be a body that's imperishable. It will not die, it will live forever. It won't be subject to aging, disease, or death. It won't be a body that's dishonored. It'll be a body that's in glory, raised in glory, it says. I always have the picture of Jesus' transfiguration. And it says, you, like the stars in the sky, will shine. This body is weakness. Some days it's hard to get up. But the resurrection body will be powerful. It'll be a spiritual body, a body controlled and animated by the Holy Spirit. It's not talking we'll be floating around as spirits. We believe in the resurrection of the flesh, of the body. What are the implications for us? To look forward in hope. Death has been swallowed up in victory, it says. Even more than that, we're to live as the people of God. We're to go na, 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 to death. Ain't, um, Megan, if you could put up that last slide, please. This is a picture in that same place, the Kapukan tomb. You walk in and you see this. This is St. Francis holding a skull in his arms, in his hands, and staring at that skull like, I'm going to die. But if you look at the bottom, there's another thing there, namely a cross. Through that cross, we live. And it's that cross that shapes our life today. C.S. Lewis said, if you read history, you'll find the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next world. Aim at heaven, you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, you'll get neither. St. Paul goes on to say, brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So what about donating organs? If I give my organs to Joe, how's God going to put my body together again? Something will be missing. My liver will be missing. No problem for God. He gives us a resurrection body. And how are we to live in the meantime? Knowing that when he appears, we'll be like him and see him as he is, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. 
We live a holy life because Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ has said, get the message out. What's the message? He said it to Martha. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And as he said to Martha, he says to you and I, do you believe this? And we say, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. And because he's risen, he has a body for you, one that will never perish. And he has a place prepared for you in the Father's house as we trust in his work for us. How about we stand? We pray to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the goodness of sending your Son, who took on a body, who allowed that body to be pulverized, who allowed it to be put on a cross through death. Death is swallowed up and we live. May we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. May we know he's Lord of the living. May we not despair of death. May we live our lives for him, knowing that whatever we do is not in vain because we have a living hope, Jesus Christ our Savior. Keep us steadfast and movable, always abounding in his work until he returns or he calls us home. All this we pray in his name. Amen. Receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen.